bright light. Enjoy. Which of us thinks of the snow or wind, the rain, as akin as being of consciousness? Most native traditions worldwide and inner esoteric traditions as well regard weather as an expression of spirit. We can communicate with the wind and wind can help us or as we hear now with a hurricane Gustav bearing down, it can hurt us. If there's drought, rain dances, and prayer can play a role that is transformative. So what about floods? Well, our guest this portion of 21st Century Radio, partners Nan Moss and David Corbin, share their experience and understanding in their Bear & Company 2008 release, Weather Shamanism, Harmonizing Our Connection with the Elements, and that's what we're going to look at this portion of our program. So Nan and David, welcome to 21st Century Radio. Hi. Thank you, Doug. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. In such a timely moment, everybody's thinking about weather, particularly when weather gets the upper hand. How did you two get into this entire subject of weather shamanism? Well, at the time that we that we actually got into this particular subject, we'd already been practicing shamanism for about a decade, and we were teaching, and it was a, a rather... A surprise um, visit from a spirit of weather and uh, a, a compassionate tongue lashing <laughs> that that from I from the weather itself that, um, really turned me around on this. Well, well, when you say that you were practicing shamanism already for a decade, describe to our audience who might not be familiar with all that that and what it entails and means. Give us, if you could, a sort of short explanation of it. Yeah, sure, um, shamanism really is. Uh, it's one. It's considered one of the oldest spiritual uh, forms in the world. Um, it, there's evidence of it dating back, you know, 20 or 30 thousand years. Probably goes back longer than that. And it's really a a um, a world view that looks at everything as being alive, everything as consciousness. And the shaman who existed all over the world and every culture that you know, there was has always had shamans. The shaman was the one who worked on behalf of the community to go and communicate with that aliveness that is everything, and that's what they call the spirit, something is that aspect of it that's alive, um, to communicate with the spirit of things, of um, nature and of other forces, to bring healing, to bring help for the community. Can you describe how you as a practitioner of shamanism or historically the shamans in any sacred society, how they come into rapport with that spirit? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's many ways in, in various cultures. What we work with here is um, the concept of core shamanism, which is the basic uh, elements of shamanism that are the same all over the world. And the way that we work and the way that many cultures all over the world work is to uh, the shaman goes into an altered state of consciousness. Um, and at that point, people say, well, you must be doing drugs, but that's not really what it's about. It's usually most of the cultures around the world use the drum, um, the, the sound of repetitive drum beat to enter an altered state of consciousness and to do what we refer to as the shamanic journey, which is to travel out of their body into the world of the spirits. When, when people dream at night, for those who have never experienced astral travel or they may not have had this sort of practice of coming into rapport with spirit in all other living matter, um, how, how would you describe it to somebody who hasn't had the experience? At least they don't think they have, but I believe everybody has. So maybe you could give us a common example of what that kind of rapport is like for an average person. Yeah, um, this is, you know, certainly dreams are a very strong element of that. We all experience these things in dreams. Um, and also, you know, from childhood, uh, almost all children, probably all children, we all probably remember as a child having um, imaginary friends, you know, an imaginary uh, playmate that we would talk to. Um, I certainly have a very clear memory of that. Um, and... You know what we are taught, as, you know, as we grow up, is that these things are just your imagination. Right, exactly, and, and so our culture loses touch with that capacity. It's like losing a muscle <laughs> because right, we don't use it anymore of of how to actually 
not only here, but listen. Speak, if you would, for a moment relative to shamanism and listening, because often in our culture, we're also busy talking. Even when you listen to somebody half the time, you're not listening to them. You're thinking about how you want to respond. But it seems to me that shamanism has so much to do with becoming um, quiet enough to hear. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. It's about listening. It's also about expanding your awareness in many different ways, as many as you can. You know, listening and looking and feeling and intuiting. And yeah. The bottom line of, of all of this work, you know, we always talk about this at workshops, is to pay attention. Right. Um, you know, if we're not, you know, most of us are not paying attention. We're listening to, you know, iPods and... To the noise of it all. And the noise of it all. And, yeah. And yet, if you just slow down for even a minute to pay attention, you'll hear the weather. Right. You'll hear what's going on. You'll feel something going on. You'll feel what, what you know, that day feels like or that moment feels like in a way that most people today just have no concept of. Yeah, we, we've interviewed so many wonderful elders over the decades that all speak to this same lack of ability in the Westerner, A, to quiet their mind, but B, to quiet their heart, to come into rapport with the livingness and the lovingness of all else in creation. So let's talk about that, because traditions, and I know you know many of the shamanic traditions, have stories of great teachers or leaders using um, weather to their advantage. Certainly people are familiar in the Bible with the story of Noah and the flood and how transformative it it was and and we know that catastrophism based on all the wonderful guests we've had on 21st century radio is always about the cyclicity the cycles of natural and earth changes so how how does coming into rapport with weather um, help us with appreciating the earth and the earth's own tempo of change oh wow yeah that, that's a real big one because you know just just again paying attention, paying attention to the the rhythm of weather and paying attention to the seasons as they change and the subtleties of of that change as they're happening. Um, and just you know knowing that all of that is connected all over the world. The weather that happens here is connected to what's happening, you know, twenty miles from here and fifty miles from here and thousands of miles from here. You Which really is- get that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, when you really pay attention and you really you know, have that connection with weather, you get that sense of, of it all being one big system. Mm-hmm. Well, like and like and the God body. Go ahead. I'm sorry, and that we're part of it all. It's, it's it, You know what you're mentioning about the great elders and their, basically we're talking about their worldview, their way of looking at the world and um, people's, you know, in cultures other than, than our busy and distracted culture and 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 you mentioned this before too. We, it's like a muscle that needs exercising. We all have the capacity to do this. We all have the capacity to wake up our listening, wake up our visioning, um, you know, wake up our our, our intuiting, and, and just wake up our connection with the aliveness in the world, with the subtleties of the world. Even a, the simplest practice of just five to ten minutes on a daily basis of going outside, you know, not looking at the weather channel, but going actually outside in the weather and paying attention to the weather for no other reason but to pay attention for the, to the weather. Um, it, 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 people have experienced great leaps and bounds in their abilities to relate. And to well, and I think one of the lovely things about your Bear and Company 2008 release, Weather Shamanism, harmonizing our connection with the elements is that you share individual practitioners who are on this journey of coming into rapport with nature. Um, you share their own stories of their own discoveries and their own hearings and listenings. When when you talk about the weather and, and weather's purpose on earth, obviously it's a living system and there's reasons for this, but, but you also describe how shamans historically and today can come into rapport with the elements or the middle kingdom that resides or presides one would say over helping the creator do these things and can actually change the weather yes yes well it's more like influencing the weather and you have to keep in mind that these shamans from these other traditions were born and raised in traditions that understood the reality of this they didn't have the unlearning that we have 
even so, it all begins with relationship, with relating to the weather, and relating to the weather and the, the elements, the forces, the spirits of weather, uh, as, a, as a good friend, if you will. Um, and then you have some influence. I, it's, it's our understanding that you cannot make the weather do anything. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Right, you can ask. Right. <laughs> you can put in your request. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a That's funny okay. story. You know, I I don't know if you know Greg Braden, but he shared a very funny story on one of my, I think it was my national program, Future Talk, and he was telling us about this elaborate, you know, rain ceremony he thought he was going to with a shaman, a medicine man, and they went for a long, long walk up into the mountains, and it took three hours, and Greg expected, you know, a very elaborate ceremony, and, and simply this medicine man went, and he stood in his circle, and he turned in the four directions, and he gave thanks to the great spirit, and then he said, now let's go get lunch. And Greg said to him, but wait a second, where's all the ritual? And he said, look, this is how you pray for something. He said, I don't pray for rain out of the absence of rain. I pray rain. Like, thank you, Creator, for giving us rain. And he told him that he imagines the wetness, he feels the wetness, he smells the rain, you know, all that comes with it tactily and sensually. And so he gives thanks to the Creator for having already brought the rain. Right. How does that fit into the way you work? Oh, it, it fits in perfectly. It's, 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 well, there, in that, there's a relationship and there's a knowing. You know, and, there's, and there's, there's gratitude, there's honoring. From the very beginning, I guess our word for it would be honoring, from the very beginning, our um, helping spirits, our helping spirits would advise us honor the weather, mm -hmm. honor the weather, and and things happen when you honor. You know, you're you're honoring, you're showing respect. It, it really sets up a very a very special um, field between you and that which you are honoring. So when you, go ahead. Another aspect of all of that, also, um, which. Yeah, you know, it, it all of these things have many levels, and right. relating and and uh, to weather as as spirits and all of that is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it that we work with very strongly is um, the the effect of changing your own inner state. Right, your inner weathers, your right. weather barometer. Am I stormy because I have anger, or am I, right. you know, a calm seas today because I'm really sitting in my heart? Right, absolutely, mm -hmm. and that. You know, that's more than just metaphor. Absolutely. And when you're honoring, you are changing that inner state, and you are thinking. Yeah, when you're relating, relating as a friend to spirits of the weather, then you are also changing your inner state. So right. all of these things really work together to um, you know, bring balance and harmony. You know, the, I, I was watching the Olympics and heard one of the officials, and I haven't, I used to be an investigative journalist, and I do other things now, but, so in the old days, I would have been on this beat and found out, but I heard one of the officials say that they took care of the weather in China. Now, those of us who understand weather engineering and the HARP project and some of these pretty deleterious things for our biosystems um, of the earth. I was wondering, did they mean they didn't allow cars nearby or they got rid of factory smog or they actually did weather engineering? Like I remember during the Bosnian War, they were talking about weather engineering sometimes to bring clouds in order to obscure the enemy's view of our planes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's something that, you know, they, I, I know that they did do that. They had talked yeah. about it. Um, and that's something that goes on actually in this country pretty much every day <clears throat> is what they call cloud seeding, where they're shooting sil silver iodide crystals into the sky, uh, either from cannons or from airplanes, to actually seed the clouds to create clouds. So that um, that's a, a chemical um, operation that's not helpful to the Earth in the long run. And I remember James DeMeo, however, in his work with orgone energy and, and the Reich work, that there's a way to bring water very gently to bring rain by that tube. You just stick in the water. It's like earth acupuncture. Right, yeah. So when you then are, are talking with the spirits of weather and, and in touch with sort of, I guess, for lack of a better way, we'll go the direction you all have talked about it as the Middle Earth, and I think Tolkien would be very happy that you have. <laughs> how, how do, what do they say about weather engineering? <laughs> well, you know, weather engineering, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, is really no different than, than the, the pollution that we're putting into the air that's causing global warming you know it's something that's getting in the way 
um, it's something that's that's creating um, more uh, disharmony um, in the world because what we're trying to do through weather engineering is create weather that we as human beings think we need. Right. My desire. Feed me now what I want. Right. Fast foods. Fast exactly. weather change. And that's a very you know, limited view. We don't know what the earth really needs. Right. As if Gaia has no agenda of her own. Right. And it also goes against the, in the face of, of the downwind effect. Mm-hmm. You know, you're mostly concentrating on what you want mm-hmm. right there. Mm-hmm. And never mind how that affects how that affects the rest of the, the area or the country or the world. Well, and I remember covering earthquakes for many years. Um, there was a database, it's no longer public, where you could find out where there was a detonation. And we discovered over time that you could pretty much calculate based on the strength of the detonation and the place that it was, whether it was in America or France or somewhere else, where there would be earthquakes elsewhere in the world. And I used to predict them on my radio program, and people thought it was all psychism. I mean, I have that, too, but it wasn't. It was really just sort of, oh, yeah, you hit the hammer on your finger, and I can tell you, your whole body shocks. Right. Yeah. I mean, how we can right. how we can think otherwise is, mm-hmm. is totally beyond me, that we think we can do all these things, you know, huge explosions deep in the earth and, and putting things into the atmosphere without an effect. Right. You know, it's just mind-boggling. Well, look, we're going to take a little break, and then if you, I'd, I'd like, if you don't mind, when we come back, to talk about some of the things you teach others about, as you mentioned, little things each person can do. Um, I've always marveled how, with all the high technology we have, weathermen still can't get the weather, but some little lady down the street could tell you, based on her body, it's not going to rain today. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Zoe Hieronymus on 21st Century Radio. We'll be right back. Hello, my name is Matthew Fox, and I'm a spiritual theologian, author of a number of books, including Christian Mystics and The Pope's War. And you are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zoe, and I commend Dr. Zoe for her wonderful work and for having a program that offers alternative ways of seeing the world and seeing it through the glasses of spirituality and ethics. So stay listening. We're back, and we're turning now to our guest. I want to come back before we talk about exercises people can do to come into rapport with nature. Several questions. One, because one of you is a man and the other a woman, and and all of us have different paths. I was curious if you two have come into rapport with kind of the same weather systems, or one of you has an affinity with the wind and perhaps another an affinity with the water. That's a great question. We're actually very different, so um, we're we're together in our in our determination and affinity for weather in general to honor weather and that sort of thing. But but we're very different individuals, and so I love wind. I um, I become very uneasy and and you know indrawn when there's no wind or breeze around. And and David has an opposite yeah, wind, reaction wind, wind to that. Yeah, wind scares me. To, to, to that way. I can't. Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> And I love rain and clouds and all that sort of stuff. And I, I but they are good partners, rain and cloud and winds. They all seem to come together. Which comes first? Yeah, really. The rain, the clouds, or the wind? Right. <laughs> How interesting. And and so then, in, in having said that, I mean, because some people say, you know, they love the water, and other people say they love the desert, and other people say they like the vista from the mountain, and others like to be in the woods. And, and I've always felt that all of those different um, environments speak to us about some aspect of our nature. So, Nan, I suggest you probably like change a lot. I do, I do, and I love storms, and so uh-huh. <laughs> I've been known to have a temper from time to time. Uh-huh. Exactly. And, and David, you like things that form the energy to make the transformation. Yes, absolutely. And the purification of it. Absolutely. I like things that are foundational and build on. Uh huh. Well, I, I saw that you teach at Esalon and you teach at the Open Society in, in New York, or is that called the Open, the Open Door? Center. Open Door, is that what it's called? Open Center. Oh, Open Center, that's right. I, I've known all these places my whole 20, 
five, 30 years, I sometimes get them all confused. I'll be calling Esalen the open Esalen pretty soon. All right, so then looking, okay, here we have a situation, and and because you all have also been in New Mexico at times, and Burning Man just kind of got burned out with the dust storm, and we have Gustav coming in to make landfall in Louisiana and Texas, and millions of people are literally fleeing for their lives. Um, what, What does it mean? Well, yeah, what does it mean? Um, you know, again, you could look at it in so many different ways. Um, for one thing, you know, the obvious, you know, big issue that's up for everyone right now is climate change, global warming and intensifying of, of storms and all of that stuff. Um, and to, <clears throat> to have, you know, so many big storms coming in at a time when there's so much strife in the world as well. Um, you know, we talk about the whole thing of, of your weather inside reflecting things outside. Well, also the weather outside reflects the state of the world, you know, right, the, the right. political state of the world, the the, the state of, of people's general you know, feeling in the world. You know, so it's interesting because so in, in the... So much difficulty going mm-hmm. on, then it, it's certainly uh, you know, reflective of... You know, the weather is reflecting that type of thing. So that's part of what's going on. Uh, I was going to say, and back to James DeMeo for a moment in the Oregon Research Institute up there in Washington State that he runs is, you know, he did this wonderful work on Sahara Asia and showed that the desertification of uh, biblical times and and I could probably even suggest some more recent times, was on the heels of awful patriarchal brutality and sexual repression. And he found that wherever that love energy was kind of clamped down and shut down and we became very hard and domineering, that literally the weather looked like that. Yes, absolutely. There's interesting stories about weather reacting to specific world events. Um, And in fact, one one of the scientific origins of weather modification of the cloud seeding is that they discovered that after major battles, particularly in the Civil War, there would be torrential rains. Mm -hmm. And from that, they decided to start trying to shoot cannons into the sky to to make it rain. Of course, They They thought it was the cannon fire and not the sorrow? They didn't think God was crying either? Yes. You know, it's interesting in the Hasidic tradition, which I'm a student of, it says when God is showering mercy, it comes down as rain in its proper time. When God is showing us a stern judgment, it comes down in the form of snow, yeah. which, it, which is interesting. One is soft and one is hard. So so then coming back to the subject of, of celebrating weather, I mean, we've sort of talked a little bit about coming into rapport about it. I know that dance worldwide, you mentioned drumming, but dance also has always been um, connected to coming into rapport with weather. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Movement, song, you know, the vibration, the movement. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, you know, we work with, in the, in the book, we talk about the concept of weather dancing, um, which is really more metaphorical of the sense of dancing with the spirits of weather, of, of flowing and um, aligning yourself, having yourself become the state of harmony that we need in the atmosphere. And truly, that's dancing with the weather, and that that can be manifested physically in dance, because when you're dancing physically, you're also bringing yourself into harmony. Yeah, and your whole self, not just your mind and not just your intention. But, you know, again, a Hasidic tradition says that when we invigorate our action, when we move our limbs to serve God or great spirit would be the way to more generalize it, um, we actually invigorate the soul. And so that the two, the body and the soul, are celebrating together. I have just a question that I'm sure some people in my audience, you know, once in a while they go, oh, God, there goes Zoe again. <laughs> you know? And her guest and Dr. Bob, they're all always out on this kind of weird edge, which is becoming very popular, interesting. I'm expecting for there soon to be a reality show, Shamans Unite. You know? <laughs> Shamans com- competition of who can talk to God the biggest. Anyway, um, how has this work affected you and your lives and, and from wherever it is you come? It's been unbelievably enriching for my life. It's, it's been a, a 
path that, that I yearned for and didn't know that I was yearning for it. It's been um, a very strong way for me to be able to serve to serve harmony in our world, to serve others. It's been a joyful path. It's brought me, it's brought me face to face with the concept of and the ideal of becoming fully human, you know, of really recognizing, recognizing who I am, who we are as humans, our, our co-creative power, mm -hmm. and the responsibility that that brings. Mm -hmm. That's an important word. And I like the fact that you talk about humility so much, because I think in all sacred societies, it's understood that without humility, you can't do this kind of work, either safely or responsibly. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Very definitely. I, I mean, a big part of this whole work is, is, has to do with ethics. It right. has to do with, with doing what's best for the whole rather than for you. And a lot of people, and even now, there are people who go out there and say, I'm going to change the weather because I want it to be sunny today. Right. And, you know, that that is not humility. That's, you know. Right. That's opposite. arrogance. Right. <laughs> that's called supreme selfishness, and we're all familiar with it. I want it now and give it to me when I want it. Right. Actually, now is not soon enough. <laughs> Somebody said that to me. We Westerners, you know, now is not soon enough. Instant gratification, that's what it was. The joke was instant gratifiers, you know, now is not soon enough. So so then in looking at, at what you teach and your, your purpose in doing this walk and what you think you're called to, what are you called to about this work? I mean, why this? There's so many ways we can help people transform. Yeah, well, one one thing is that this is, uh, is you know, the importance goes very, very deep, not only in transforming ourselves, but, you know, look at the, the state of the world at the moment. It's really about helping, you know, on one level, the environment, you know, over, you know avoid catastrophe of global warming and all of that, and it goes deeper than that still, because there's just so much more that has to change in this world in what we do and how we think and how we feel. And by really coming into relationship by understanding that everything is alive it really you know it makes it very difficult to harm something right right exactly and the world really is, is being harmed by it by even by our thoughts you're watching television seeing all the things that go on in the world watching the news mm -hmm. it's just mind-boggling mm -hmm. how mindless many people are being in the world and, and, and how how desensitized your whole autonomic nervous system really becomes. I mean, I've often said to people, we see more murder and horrible things on television than any human will likely ever see in a lifetime, yes. ever, even come into contact with. Absolutely. And and it's, it's, it's yeah, it's one I don't watch anymore, but for 10 years I covered the news every day of the week, three and five hours a day on air, and I, I really discovered the darkness, and it just broke my heart, and then I had this great return to God, and how wonderful, <laughs> like, thank you, world, Absolutely. you know, for showing me that Absolutely. there's just such beauty in it. When, when you then um, do this work, is, has there ever been a time where you've been in active dialogue, conversation, rapport with weather, where you got frightened of something? Oh, Absolutely. You know, there's times when I've been caught in storms, and um, I'm already frightened because I'm caught in a storm. But then, when I, when I, when I move beyond my fear, and and do a simple thing, I was caught in a storm once, and it was a very fierce storm. So much so, I felt that that there was a tornado nearby, and I thought the hail was going to break through my car um, windshield. That. And so I was trembling. I was terrified. And so, and finally, I realized, wait a minute. I have these things I can do here. I can talk to this storm. Right. And so I had no rattle, no drum with me. I just clapped my hands and started chanting. And after a while, I was able to move beyond my fear and expand out into the storm. And I had a conversation. And I lost, you know, I lost my terror. And when I opened my eyes, the sun was bursting through the clouds and the rain was soft. It was, it was a remarkable experience for me. Because I've often, I've interviewed a number of storm chasers over the decades, and, and they fascinate me in the same way, you know, mountain climbers who feel they must go when it's snowing, and, you know, and white water rafters can only go right in the midst of a big storm. Um, do, you, do you think that in some ways some people, as you described of yourselves, have affinity with certain spirits, and they may not be conscious of it, but that, in fact, it calls it to them so they can learn something about that particular strength? Yes, yes, that's that's quite common in the shamanic world. 
Definitely. Mm-hmm. And, and as you go around teaching people, particularly Westerners, and I, I'm sure people who come to your workshops come because they have affinity with your worldview, um, what about for people who really don't believe the Earth is a conscious being and there's no such things as this middle world and that there really aren't spirits and elementals? What, what do you say to a person who says, come on, guys, you all sound nuts? Well, we, we kind of ask them, what would you have to lose by simply trying on another worldview? It's not that you have to give up the worldview that you have. You don't have to give it up at all. But just try on, maybe just for, this, for a weekend, a weekend in our workshop or something, just try to expand your worldview and ask just to see what would it be like if you actually thought this was real. I mean, what if you got to lose? And the other thing I would tell them is to pay attention. Mm -hmm. If they were able to pay real close attention without their disbelief in front of them, they couldn't help but see that there's more going on than what they think is going on. Exactly. And and that then your place in the world becomes very important. I think one of the things I love so much about the ancient wisdom teachings coming into the Western world at this time and place for all the world to utilize, I mean, it's really a commingling of ancient and modern appreciation for the oneness of all, is, is the way in which people are allowed to be creative. I mean, it's not like somebody saying, well, here's the dogmatic way that you celebrate the creator's wind, you know, but but you go around and you make it possible for people to really understand that they are co-creators. So when we come back, I want to talk about the responsibility of learning some of these things, because there's also that truth. You know, many teachings have been underground for centuries, perhaps until there's a, a groundswell of um, humans who appreciate just what we've always known throughout the world, that we're all one. So when we return, we'll pick up there our guests, Nan Moss and David Corbin. Don't go away. More to come after this. Find guest links and information at www.21stCenturyRadio.com. We'll be right back. This is John Torgerson of Seed Savers Exchange at www.seedsavers.org, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Sohara Hieronymus. Thank you. Let's get right back to our guest. I want to come, though, to the to the place you begin, which is humility, love of other, coming into rapport with the great spirit, and the responsibility that this kind of relationship, what it requires of us as humans. It requires just that, responsibility, the, the, the need for us to really know why we're doing things, know what our motives are. Because when you do work this way and when you work in relationship with spirits, um, there is power that, that comes of that, and power is like electricity. and It can be used for good, it can be used for harm, um, and our responsibility is to make sure that we are truly what we like to call hollow bones, being able to transmit the compassionate power, healing power from these realms, bring it to this world um, in, in a way that is not altered by you know, other motives, by uh, ego, by greed, or anything like that. We really need to be clear that the reason that we're doing this, whether it's shamanism for healing or weather shamanism, the reason we're doing this is for healing. You know, weather shamanism is about healing the earth and healing the atmosphere. There's other aspects of shamanism that's about healing illness, and healing people, and healing communities. Um, so the real responsibility is to know why you're, you're doing any of this stuff, to know who you are as a person, what your place is, and, you know, and where your compassion is, to really get in touch with your own compassion. I mean, so, for, for example, here we have a situation where our technology allows us to see storms well in advance, um, enough so that you can evacuate millions of people, fly in troops for the aftermath. I mean, what's going on right now in Louisiana is unprecedented. And, and yet, at the same time, I wonder, do people appreciate the power of prayer to alleviate some of perhaps the intensity of what's coming down. I mean, there are many traditions who will say that devastating storms are judgments and they're appropriate judgments to help refine humanity because after storms, people come together, they take care of each other. There's always this beneficence, this all of a sudden race disappears, socioeconomic division disappears. And and that was, you know, in, in biblical history, you often saw that these miracles, like the parting the Red Sea, this miracle, the water rising up as, as glass, 
glass walls, which I do believe actually did occur, um, that this is an incredible instance of some could say Moses put out his, you know, the people walked in and the waters rose up, whether it was the great spirit of God himself doing it or the consciousness of the people praying. Um, talk to us a bit about prayer. Yeah, prayer is, is a, it, you know, prayer is really an embodiment of your compassion, asking for help for people. And prayer is very important, and very powerful. I think prayer is also a focused form of intention. Um, there's different kinds of prayer. The kind that I work with the most is, is a prayer of affirmation, of gratitude and affirmation of that which I'm praying for. And when you've gone around teaching, and I see that you've been um, on the faculty of, uh, what is the program called? I've just lost my place. Michael Harner's program. Share with us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, the you know the Foundation for Shamanic Studies um, is an organization that uh, Michael Harner, an anthropologist, founded, and it, it really is dedicated to uh, preserving and uh, reawakening shamanic knowledge in the world for the purpose, again, of relieving pain and suffering, of bringing mm-hmm. healing mm-hmm. Um, wherever it, it, it is needed. Well, it's it's a it's a beautiful thing that you all are doing, which is to make something that might seem so remote to people and so specialized with in only the indigenous people's traditions and and really bringing spirit into the lives of any person who wants to read your book. Whether shamanism are there are there things that have um, that you can point to that in some ways you've been changed by this work. I mean, how would you say it's changed you rather than how it's affected you? I had asked you earlier. In a very simple way, in the simplest way, it's it's changed my attitude. It's changed. Um, I, it's made me a lot more mindful of my thoughts and my responses. You know, in our in our culture, where it's very easy, we habitually curse the weather. We we feel like we're entitled to complain about the weather. About oh, another you know another rainy day. Whether and we do that whether we need the rain or not. That happens all too often. So it's a it's a very beginning is mm-hmm. it's made me a lot more mindful and a lot more appreciative and also it's helped me to honor the differences maybe i'm not so fond of a rainy day after six of them but but it's still something that needs to be honored it's not all about me and my wants yeah and, and you know for me you know I, I grew up in new york city which was a place where the weather was something that you didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to it. It was either cold or not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Either it was okay to walk all those right. blocks or you hailed a cab or got in the subway. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, you know, really doing this work has, you know, opened up a whole new world. <laughs> and, and I see that you all live in Maine yeah. and, and on a port. Yeah, we're right on, on the, the end of the peninsula. It's, 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 so we're surrounded on essentially three sides by water. So. Well, you know, I've spent, you don't know this, but I spend a good part of every week on the water, on a river here in Maryland, which I felt that I had to do. After doing 10 years of current events, I literally had to find water. I was so desperate for water, I would have done anything to get there. And um, and went into silence for about a year after all that noise of talk and opinion. And my own voice, I couldn't even listen to my own voice, strangely enough. Um, and, and I have found now, I just adore I mean, I can't be away now from the water for very long. Right. Yeah, I know, I know the feeling. Water is, is very healing. Um, and you know, water is such an integral part of us and of the world and, and of course, of weather. It's, it's all around us. Well, can I pass on to you a little shamanic ritual of my own? Sure. Uh, and this is, you know, I, I too believe in, in alchemy and in the capacity of all humans to really heal the earth and, and our planetary consciousness to come to unity. So this is what I saw one day when I was meditating June 21st, 2001. I realized that solar prayer is very vertical, very masculine. Sun up, sun down, we pray, we thank God, we praise God, whatever, in traditions worldwide. So I thought, what would a more feminine form of praise and prayer look like? and I realized it would be very horizontal. And so I had this experience of the tide. And so when the tide came up closest and highest, I would go down to the water and I would simply whisper into the water, I love you. 
And I did this every high tide for, you know, a couple of weeks, two, twice a day, comes in, goes out. And I started writing about it for Lily Poe, the anthropological, anthropo- anthroposophical magazine, and talking to others about it, that no matter where you live, whenever the tide comes in and is high, whisper I love you into the water, because then she takes it back down into the deepest part of her body. And um, so anyway, that's my own little contribution to something small. You can turn on your tap water and say, I love you to the water. You go to drink a glass of water. I love you. And, and it really then circulates love through the waters of the world. Exactly. And, and for the atmosphere, you could take a bowl of water. We've done this in ceremony before, but you can also take that bowl of water and whisper, I love you. I love you. You know, and put it out in the atmosphere to evaporate. How beautiful. Yeah. See, we're all coming to the same yeah. sort of, oh, yes, we really can do this work. Yeah. We absolutely can. Yeah. It's, it's our birthright. Yeah. And, and, in fact, yeah. we do this work yes. unconsciously all the time. And, and badly because we're unconscious. Becoming right. you, conscious, becoming you, aware of what we're doing and doing it intentionally. Mm-hmm. How, how different to, to know that it's that it's the great work of one. And and one of the interesting interviews I once did was with Joe Allen, an astronaut who was in charge of communications for all the Apollo 7 and other flights. And I asked him, I said, well, do the astronauts ever talk about human consciousness one day becoming the pilot that will take our ship Earth and move it throughout the solar system? And I was so pleasantly surprised when he answered yes. So it's it's not just, quote, unquote, the new age where people, I think physics has finally caught up with mysticism. Absolutely. And the crossroads now of science and consciousness are really integrating to show everybody on the planet that your thoughts matter and your words matter and your actions and your intentions matter. All we have to do is pay attention and we can see that. It's, mm-hmm. it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. And how do your families, from where you were born... Look at the work you're doing now. <laughs> They're actually very supportive and respectful. I, I never thought I'd see it. <laughs> I hear David laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm it's, most it's, grateful. It's, yeah, it, it, yeah. David's parents, on the other hand, would would their their way was to ask us every time we came to visit. Now, what is that you're doing again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought they were going to ask you. Will it be sunny? <laughs> I mean, if. You, if you've got contacts, can you use them? And and let's close on that because let's say somebody in the audience says, yep, they can come into rapport with the weather and they can make it rain and they can make it sunny. When is it appropriate to ask the nature spirits to help? It is. There are times when it's absolutely appropriate. And, and you said it right there. You're asking for help. You're reaching out to the helping spirits and you're asking on behalf of the realm so for any of us who practice this form of, of um, shamanism or weather shamanism, we, we would go to our helping spirits, the weather spirits that we know, and we'd ask them, what's going on here? And we'd talk with the spirits of the realm. Uh, some, one time we were together and we thought we were going to have a, a wonderful evening of drought busting. You know, the area was really dry, and, and we, we thought that it needed that it needed rain. Mm-hmm. And the spirits all said, every one of us, nine people that night, came back from their journeys with a message from the spirits, leave it alone, it's needed. Mm-hmm. And, and the other thing we can yeah. do, not only to ask for help, but to ask how we can help. Mm-hmm. There's a storm, a big storm like this hurricane in the Gulf right now, very important for us um, as practitioners to ask the spirit of the storm, what do you need from us? How can we help you do the work that you need to do while not you know, helping it to do that, suffering. minimizing mm-hmm. pain and suffering and damage. Mm-hmm. And right. right. It's really, it, it really makes us wince when we read uh, headlines like the wrath of this storm right. or hear right. people speaking about a storm like, as if it were out to get them. You know, right, the enemy. Is, uh-huh. Right, it's, it's, it's part of Mother Earth. Mm-hmm. And, and how do we know that these hurricanes coming in are not, are not working for that, that dead zone that, that the whole Gulf is filled with? You know, where the hurricanes currently head. Exactly. It's a huge dead zone. Exactly. You know, and in primal, back in three or four billion years ago on this planet, we have hurricanes and, and, you know, all those primal storms to thank for our atmosphere, for the distribution of life, their their incredible lightning, uh, their incredible force of their lightning energize these, these inert chemicals and things, I guess, bringing life force. It makes me think of the Frankenstein movie with the lightning going <laughs> 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 and 
there's life. You know? <laughs> right. And and we can create it. Well, I think I think ultimately what we and you write about is that we are co-creators and we are made in the creator's image. And what that means is we are responsible also for how we do what we do and why we do it. Yes. And um, I, I think you all have done a great job. I want to thank you for joining us so much and and thank you for your wonderful works in the world i'd like to know more about them well we'll start with weather shamanism as a close for this hour but follow up with nan moss and david corbin after the program at www.shamanscircle that's s-h-a-m-a-n-s circle.com you can order their book weather shamanism at either amazon.com or you can order it from baron company 1-800-246-8648 Thank you all for listening to 21st Century Radio. Stay tuned for more. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Lara Kortner. Our engineer is A.Y. Warshaw. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, and we hope you've enjoyed the show.